Whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ka uta, ki a mā tāra tāra ki tai, e he aki an ate atakura, he hio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei, mauri ora. Ki te mihi, ki te mi, ki te whare, kā hui ariki, e tenei wā puri, e te kini tuheitia, te tumu heringa waka o te ao mauri. Moi mai, moi mai, moi mai rā. Ka huri nā mihi ke te mana whenua nā iwi e te, e te rohe nē. Rangatera mā, tēnā koutou. I acknowledge the bereaved royal house of Tehutia at this time of sadness. King Tehutia, highly respected leader and mainstay of the Māori world. Sleep now, rest now, be at peace. I turn my acknowledgements to the indigenous peoples of the land and area, esteemed ones, descendants of chiefs, I greet you. I'd now like you to stand for a moment's silence. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the new Māori Queen, uh, Nā Wai Hono Ete uh, Pō Paki. Right, we'll now move on with the body of the meeting. Um, we have apologies from Councillor Maru. Uh, everyone else is in attendance. And since someone please move the apologies be accepted. Uh, move Councillor Hill, second to Councillor Dowler. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. We'll now move to the public forum. So we have four speakers registered for the public forum and I'll take them in the uh, order uh, in which they were received. So firstly, we have uh, Eugene speaking on behalf of Nati Kuya. Switchy microphone. That's all good. Ah, uh, ten Kinga Fano, Kinga Rangatira Utitawihu, Tena Koto, Tena Koto Kato. Kuyujing Sakahuihu Toko Ingwa, he to me toyo Tiruna Nati, Kuya, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Koto Kato. Ah, Kotai my Naki Te Toto Kutiko Papa, or Te Maori Wards. Um, for myself, like today is, is both a sad day. Um, it's a disappointing day because of the decisions that you have to make. Terrible decisions, given what we're going through at the moment with our, the loss of our king tanga, but also the movement of and our travel that we've made as Māori, as people in this area over the last few years. Almost like a back step. I'd like to talk about the backdrop of the decisions that you're making, and I'll, I'll be brief. Um, essentially, you've been forced to make unpleasant decisions. Okay, so... Karoha, o kia, kia koutou. Um, you've been forced to make decisions. And on the backdrop of other decisions that have been made from our central government, a whole litany of stuff which is detrimental to Māori, to our people in general. Heartfelt, um, the loss and disestablishment of Tiaka Faiora, the relentless pursuit um, of, our, of our health systems, uh, changes to smoking legislation, uh, 7 AA, oh, um, Many kaupapa, which is disappointing to see, um, which is impacting. But probably the most significant for me is being forced into a position where you've been forced to surrender your rights and obligations as councillors, as elected members of this rohe. Okay, forced down the track, which will only lead to more disappointment, regardless of the outcome today as we, as we move forward. So difficult times for all. I just want to just mihi 
the fact that it is unpleasant, that your hand has been forced in many ways, okay? And there was just more difficulty. So I'd just like to present, for because for myself and as representative of Ngāti Kui, and I'd say for Māori katoa ki tēnei rohe, that the, um, the problems we're trying to solve through these decisions um, are probably poorly understood. So I'd like to take this time to actually frame some problem sets that you could use to reconcile, to consider in retaining and establishing Māori wards. And I think if we go back to the instruments that New Zealand is founded upon, and that is honouring Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and if we look and reflect upon those principles, and I think there's two relevant ones here. Firstly, it's the partnership. As uh, Hapu Hapu Māori, Tiwi Māori, partners with the Crown. So Māori wards provide a mechanism of which to do this, to provide our voice to the spaces and places that are important, to the decisions that are important to us. The other part is participation. And we know just through years and years of making important decisions on behalf of other people, that we, when we don't have those voices included in our decisions, the majority of those decisions are poor and end with poor outcomes for our people and for our law here in general. So I believe that returning and establishing the Māori ward provides an opportunity to resolve and actually give effect to honouring Te Tiriti o Waitangi. You also have legal obligations under various acts, um, local government, electoral acts, for example, which requires councils to provide opportunities for Māori in decision-making. So you've already got a mechanism in the form of award to support you to do better in your decision-making, to fulfil your obligations both as a treaty partner, but also as a... Um, as part of your legal obligations as councillors, as elected officials. The last part, and I'll try and bundle this up into a single uh, kaupapa, and that is we know, and history tells us, that Māori have been underrepresented at decision tables across many boards, across many organisations. Our voice is not heard. This provides you the opportunity to contribute to the resolution of that problem. The other part of this is it's not only about the seat, it's also about the person providing us with the opportunity to elect the person with the right skills, knowledge and attitude to lead and make decisions that are important to us in the spaces and places that are relevant to Ngā iwi or Te Tauihu here, now and into the future. We have massive expectations of not only the person that will hopefully take that seat, but also expectations of what the seat means to all of our people, is, as we've seen. The collective aspirations that's been listed in the partnership agreement can be further. We can take that further than we dreamed. But we need the right mechanisms and we need the right people in place to make this a reality. So for the councillors, and to inform your decision, um, kia kaha, kia toa, kia manu anui. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, next up, we have Peter Cantor.
Thanks, Tim. Thanks, councillors, and thanks for the opportunity to be here um, to talk about this this item because I think it's quite significant and certainly to our community. We didn't have that choice before when the council went ahead and voted for the um, the the start of Murray Wards, and so I thank you very much for having that choice today. It's on now. that yep. um, invite. So, um, Karen wrote it down. What's the number? Stop the clock. So, yeah, that's all right, Peter. I'll cut you. I'll cut you thirty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Yep. Look, and I really don't envy you guys one little bit. Either way today, you're going to have egg on your face. But I do believe that you've just got to get away from the ideology and just vote on what you believe is the right thing to do. Now, um, I know that with the past decision, when you didn't have to make that decision, but you made that decision, and you probably made it with admirable causes. But the, our community out there certainly felt that they were treated with a bit of contempt because they they didn't get the right to vote there, have their piece of democracy to vote on whether Mary Walter is a good thing or not. Now, I want to start with a, a meaning of a word, and then I'll give you the word. And that meaning is separate segregation, a system of keeping groups of people separate and treating them differently. The word is apartheid. And I feel that what we're doing here is we're going down a slippery slope when you create a, a ward that's based on race or birthright as opposed to being open for everybody. And that, to me, is why I'm here. I don't want to be here. I would have thought I had better things to be doing, but nothing is better than coming here. I don't want my grandkids, my mokapuna, to say, Dad or Granddad, how did this happen? How come there's one set of systems or rights for one group and not for the other? And so I think it is my duty to so like Makapuna. I want to go right back to the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, when a lot of people were leaving England. They were coming out here, and a lot of them were trying to escape that system of hierarchy, that system of lords that was brought about by birthrights. And they've come out here, and I can't believe here we are in 2024, all of a sudden trying to create another system that's created around birthright. To me, I find that absolutely abhorrent. And I think our forebears would be certainly a pull by it as well. We go on to, let's look at the principles of the treaty. And I heard Eugene say, and I certainly agree, some of the principles of the treaty are fantastic. We've got Kawanatanga, the governing of, of Aotearoa, New Zealand by the Crown. <coughs> Tino Rangatiratanga, the right for them to govern their own customs, cultures, as well. But the one I love is the Oretetanga, Maori having equal rights and citizens of New Zealand. This one is the most crucial, and it's in Article 3, having equal rights as every other non maori in New Zealand. And I want to uphold that. What that means is Maori don't have any lesser rights. But conversely, it also means they should have no greater rights as well. They should be equal. And what we're doing here by creating a ward specifically based on race, birthright, whatever it is, is actually, to me, is against the principles of that treaty. How are we going? Two more? Okay. I've got a minute. Oh, okay. But now Eugene mentioned about partnership and participation. You guys are already doing that. We have um, Renee here. I think that you second certain iwi onto on your committees. That is the way to do it rather than to have a Mary based board, but to actually second them onto those committees, you get the skilled person that you want. Uh, and I think that that stops the division as well. What's happened is here, we've thrown a huge rock into the pool of division and it's only getting better. I don't envy you with your decision. If you are going to go ahead with uh, establishing a Maori ward, I think that it's quite critical then that I think there should be a ward for farmers as well. No one has contributed more to the, the growth of our terror New Zealand than the farmers. And I certainly think if you're going to do that, well, let's go down that ward of, of, of Maori's as well. Um, and but yeah, uh, give me a second. Oh, I mean, I have that with count. I have 10 minutes. Oh, no, uh, no, no, 30, 30 seconds. Um, 30 seconds. Um, okay, I would also like to think that it's, this is quite critical to our community. They need to know where we stand, and I, I know amongst my people, I report not at the not at the fact that that it, but it's about the ward, it's about the race-based thing. So I'd certainly like to think that 
there's a division called, if there is, I'd like one councillor at least to put up and say we'd like a division coach, because I think our community needs to know, do we stand up for apartheid or do we stand up for democracy? They never had that choice on democracy. And I think that democracy is the best thing and that's the thing that is most worth fighting for. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Peter. I know you're both with conscience. Oh, he wants to on. And I can't get time down, even with my extended. So uh, next Thanks. up we have uh, Maxwell Clark. Bring out the winery you bought and the eyes are a bit red. I'm sorry about that. I've actually um, got cataracts and uh, I've just had surgery. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the good folks here for being here. Um, I have a slightly different view, um, and I'd like it to be considered. Um, I have, um, I'm, uh, my whanau uh, of Maori descent, so I want to put that out there. I've got some very strong um, uh, family members who would like me to speak on their behalf here today. The strong, young, modern, and people, and they would like to be heard. One of the issues I have is, and then the most critical component is today, is if you vote for a Maori um, seat today, you know full well that come come 2025 at the local elections, you're going to have a referendum to retain the seat. Um, so. I realised that in September 2023, you voted to support a Maori seat. However, the circumstances have critically changed since then, and the referendum is now part of the process the government has insisted on. I realised that three days ago, you had a what I would say is a secret workshop on this subject, and I hope today that you're able to have a robust, open conversation, and you haven't formulated a response uh, for this meeting today. Um, I think it's very important to look at the issues. The issues to us, my father would say, and they bring the following things to the, to the table, is you do have Maori representatives at the council. Maori's uh, represent approximately 11% of the population in the Tasman District Council. Currently on this council, you have three councillors who I believe identify as, as a Maori of Maori descent, Councillor Hill, Brent and Dan, and I think that is a, a very good representation. You've got 25% of the councillors uh, give you good representation. I th believe they do an excellent job to representing the, the Maoris and Iwis around the council chambers. So this Maori war, my young now are concerned and they feel very strongly about that if today other councillors vote against um, vote for this Maori ward, basically what you're implying is these three Maori representatives you currently have on, on your council are not representing their local Maori or iwi. And in our view, it's not the case. We think they do an excellent job and it would damage their mana. I don't accept that we they aren't doing a good job. The young uh, whanau are politically aware and, sh and all councillors should be a vote today for a Maori war today would mean a binding referendum in, in the ne next uh, local body elections in 2025. My whanau have a realistic viewpoint in that, and they say it's uh, most likely you'd be unexpected to win that binding referee on Maori seats in 2025, going on past that things. A loss at that stage would mean that the Maori wards would be off the agenda for many, many years in the Tasman District Council. With respect to the council and the whanau, I would like to say the council do not support a Maori ward today, but not support that would mean that you wouldn't have a vote on it, which in my view and my whanau's view would leave the door slightly ajar for a potential Maori ward seat and representative in the future. To vote now and support and against voting off at a referendum would close that door. And that's uh, where, where I'd come from. Your, thank you. Thank you, Maxwell. Uh, and last up, we have Shane Graham uh, on behalf of Nati Rarua. Welcome, Shane.
And I thought though, and I'm not able to it's a party. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mexico. Uh, thank you, Eugene, for your corridor. Uh, and I call it Timu to Karakia, Mito Mehiki to Tatu Kini to Haitia, Chirakia, Nawai, Hono it to Po, Pia to Ana, you know, the Tedon top. Thank you for your kind words. Well, it is interesting and challenging times, aren't they? And uh, once again, we're back here at the table to find ourselves re litigated, re talking about what I thought we decided to agreed upon last time by government who seems to have another agenda. Um, we appreciate from the Runanga, from Ngāti Rārua, uh, although I'm here today with my own personal hat on as well, that we uh, support Māori wars, but we don't support the referendum. The position we have is more about just ensuring the representation of Māori voices in local government, but it's, uh, it's about honouring some of the things that we talked about here today with our previous speakers, about honouring democracy, equity and justice where the tyranny of the majority essentially means when two wolves, the sheep, decide who's for dinner, who wins. It's not a 51%, 41% issue here with something going bad to 49%. Because most countries, if you look back and look at the constitutional arrangements of this country, only three have codified constitutions. And we're talking about constitutional matters here, not talking about local government. These are some things that are handed down for us in terms of our national framework of how our constitutional arrangements have been made. We're struggling at the moment because we've been dictated by ministers with only one, one seat and one level of government who are pushing through these legislations at a rapid pace, who I think Sir Geoffrey Palmer has alluded to, and thank you for those who uh, alluded me to the document, uh, lurching towards constitutional impropriety. And what does that mean? And uh, he has, dis has, has expressed deep concern as our leading constitutional thinker around the direction of our practices constitutionally. The goalposts are changing halfway through the game. The referee is changing the rules as we go along. And instead of 80 minutes, we're giving 14 minutes to complete the task. That's not fair. That's not ticket on you or anybody throughout this whole process. He warns out we've been weakened our democracy when policies are pushed through without proper checks and balances, without the voice of the people being truly heard. The warning resonates with us all, especially as we contemplate your decisions today that affect the fundamental rights of Māori to be fairly represented in the councils of our land. Large ratepayers, landowners, contributions to the the revenue that's generated for this council by the region surely would maintain that someone has a strategic partnership and relationship at a table which makes the broader decisions. I've said that before and I'll say it again. This country's legal framework reflects an understanding of the country's diverse social, cultural and historical maker. The problem is not law, it's constitution that we need to go back and look at. The idea that New Zealanders are one people is often invoked to promote unity and social cohesion. However, this notion does not align with the reality of our legal system and constitutional landscape, which recognises and accommodates differences, particularly between Māori and non māori It's in our constitution. It's already there in law, legally, constitutional law. So the difficulty is how do you give evidence to that at a local government well, the Māori wards are one way we can do that. We can share decision-making and look through and reflect in the numerous pieces of legislation, court decisions and government policies that are coming down. Māori wards are not a threat to democracy, as we've heard. They are for fulfilment of it. They ensure we have a historically been underrepresented, have a guaranteed voice, a guaranteed voice that shape the futures of our region to Tauihu. Our partnership agreements, our Tohihu strategies, we're all signed up to. But we find it difficult to get over the hump to find out how do we actually technically, operationally put it into practice. This is one way we do that. The danger of a referendum is why we don't support it, and we're in agreement, is because it places the rights of the majority at the mercy uh, rights of the minority at the mercy of the majority. We must ask ourselves, is this truly democratic? Or are we 
as Sir Geoffrey cautioned, at risk of undermining the very principles that make our democracy strong. So for Hearts or Ngāti Rāru and the other whānau who I'm here today speaking on behalf as well, we actually just think about that, think about the legacy you wish to leave as the leaders to uphold, yes, intergenerationally, the values of equity, justice and partnership, or in a moment in decision, choose the path for least resistance, allowing the fear of change to have a shadow, the premise of a fair, more inclusive society. God save the king. God save the king is what I've often heard around here. Long live our queen. Tenatatu. Well, thank you. That draws us to the conclusion of the public forum. Uh, just before I go for any declarations of interest, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the Council's Kamatua. So, Harvey, Jane, welcome. Uh, thank you for all the work you do on our behalf and, and the support you provide both me personally and the Council as a whole uh, in your role. So, uh, acknowledgements to both of you. Are there any declarations of interest? If not, there are no late items. We'll move on to the uh, one item on the agenda, uh, which is the decision on the Māori ward as required um, under the Local Government Electoral Legislation on Māori Wards and Māori Con Constituencies Amendment Act 2024. Uh, Lise Renee, welcome, uh, and John, I'll hand over to you to introduce the report, um, add anything you wish to before I open it up for uh, questions and or debate. <coughs> Uh, through the chair, I will take the report as read. Um, the only thing I will add to the report is uh, since it was finalised, we've gotten some updated numbers from our election services provider. The cost of a referendum is now estimated between $35,000 and $55,000. Um, other than that, I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Kia ora, Rene, is there anything you'd like to add? Okay, thank you. Uh, so the uh, item is open for discussion. Uh, obviously, if people have questions uh, and or there's a mover and seconder or comments that people would like to make, um, we will proceed with the discussion. Councillor Maywing. Well, I'm happy to move the motion as an item three, and I'd just like to speak to it briefly to start with. Uh, and I've given this a lot of thought over the last two days because um, I've certainly talked to a lot of people in the um, community and they had a, a, a view that is different from this. But I don't think they understand the Local Government Act and our obligations to it. And I've printed out a couple of sections here which I think are very relevant. And one is section four about the Treaty of Waitangi and our obligations under the Local Government Act to that. And the other is... Section 10, where it talks about our obligations for cultural development in our district. So that's why I support this in particular. And I also want to just mention some projects where we have worked particularly well with Iwi over the years. And I actually want to acknowledge somebody in the gallery, Barney Thomas, who I sat with 20, 22 years ago when we first sat with YWAC and looked at water augmentation. And that was a true partnership. And Barney didn't mince any words at those meetings over those years. And he actually helped us hugely in getting that project over the line. So I'd like to thank you for that, Barney. Um, we certainly had some blunt words at times, but it worked well and we got it over the line. And the dam actually sits on Iwi land now, which it didn't when we, when we first had those discussions. 
The other areas where I think where we work particularly well with iwi over the last few years has been the future development strategy and also on plan changes. Those have also helped because we had iwi involvement and advice. And the one other area is a committee that I chair that is jointly with Nelson City, and that's the Nelson Regional Sewerage Business Unit, where we have a member on that committee who is a Maori Ward councillor from Nelson City. And during that time, his perspective on our decision making has assisted us greatly. So that demonstrates to me we're having a Maori member on council will assist us in our decision making going forward. And I don't think it's perfect having a Maori ward because if you want to be on the Maori role and you're in Richmond and you, you're all going to vote in the Maori ward, you only get one vote for one councillor. Whereas if you're on the general role, you get four and you get the vote for the mayor as well. So you actually get less of a say as a member on the Maori role than you would if you're on the general role. And I see that as a disadvantage, but I see it helping us in our obligations that we have under the local government. Act. Hence, that's why I've moved this motion and I'm happy to support it. And I'd urge my fellow councillors to support it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mayling. Now, before I move on, is there a seconder? Councillor Hill. Thank you. So uh, the motion is moved and seconded. Other, well, first of all, are, are there any questions? Feel free to ask questions. Also, if you have a perspective you'd like to put across, by all means do that as well. Uh, I just think it is important to remember, while this is a very, I, I guess, important day, and clearly that's reflected by the number of people who are attending um, to, I guess, see the outcome. It's also only the start of a process. In some ways, this is the smallest part not necessarily the least important, but certainly perhaps less important than a decision that's going to be made approximately 12 months down the track. But how we start the debate and how it's undertaken is probably as important as the decision itself. So, I mean, that approach, which I think this council has consistently done with some other challenging decisions um, about constructive collateral, um, listening to different perspectives and ultimately making decisions, uh, I do hope that that continues through the 12 months uh, and into the, the substantive discussion. And in some ways, that's been reflected over the last seven days um, for those who may have been observing some or, or part of the um, uh, the, um, the Tūlanga YY experience uh, and that call for unity. And right at the moment, it does seem kind of further away than perhaps it did 12 months ago. Um, but I think everyone seems to acknowledge from both sides of the political spectrum and those with some very different views uh, politically that uh, Kingi to Haiti's lasting uh, legacy will be that call for uh, Katahitanga. And ultimately, hopefully over the next 12 months, we can have the debate, we can have the discussion, we can understand the different perspectives and views that people have, um, but we can do it in a way that actually doesn't create more division. Other comments, feedback, don't feel as though you have to, it's not compulsory, so I'm not going to make everyone you know, put their two cents worth in, but if you wish to, by all means do so, I'll start with um, Councillor McKenzie and followed by Councillor Joe Chris. Thank you very much through you, Mr Mayor, and um, uh, good points you've just made. Um, yeah, I would just like to, to uh, say a few things. Um, but I'd like to start off by acknowledging all the people who have emailed me on this particular issue. Um, none of you have received a reply, but you can take this as my, uh, my reply to your email. Um, yeah, I want to indicate uh, that today I will be supporting the decision to uh, continue uh, with our prior decision to establish a Maori ward. Um, as annoying as it is that we're going to have to incur those central government mandated costs to hold a referendum. Um, for me, actually, the decision is, is quite straightforward. Um, yes, it contributes to meeting our partnership obligations under the treaty, but also, you know, I'm a pragmatic person and, and I believe uh, that governance bodies uh, need to make the best decisions that they can. And the best decisions are actually made if everybody understands the full context 
uh, to those decisions. And the way that you gain that full context is actually having a good representation uh, of views and ways of thinking uh, to achieve that. And so, you know, I think that um, this decision will help to support uh, good governance, actually, for TDC and, and the district and all the ratepayers will benefit from that. So, so I think it's, it's a, a reasonably straightforward decision. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, Councillor Shellcress. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, um, obviously, uh, the word I really find uh, very interesting um, in the room today. It's obviously a scary place to be for someone like myself, new into the space. But I think this is a real opportunity for someone that may not get into the space to have have a look around and, and have another set of eyes and set of ears. I think it's going to be really um, good for the decision making that we have to do every time we're in these rooms, in this room. Um, so I'm definitely going to support it. And um, I'm sure there's some amazing candidates out there. And I've actually met a few in my um, talking to lots of people out there uh, in the district that would uh, take that role on. And um, that's really reassuring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kinnamont. Thank you, through the Chair. Uh, I've got a question for our team here. The Maori Ward is going to represent all iwi in Tasman area, no matter whether they're on the Maori role or not? Through the Chair, um, the oath that is taken by an elected representative uh, in a Maori Ward is exactly the same as the oath taken by a regular Ward Councillor, and that is to represent the um, district as a whole. So I'm not sure if that's entirely the question, but I think the key point to make is it's not an iwi-based ward, it is a Māori-based ward, and probably the majority of people on the Māori role don't necessarily affiliate to any of the eight iwi in Te Tauihu. They may well be uh, Māori from other parts, but it's the Māori role that determines determine whether or not you can vote in the Māori ward, not your affiliation to the iwi. So, if you're an iwi person, not on the Maori roll, you can't vote for that ward. Correct. You have to make the choice to be on the Maori roll, regardless of your iwi affiliation or not, okay. in order to vote in the Maori, okay. Maori ward. Yeah, correct. I'd also like to thank you for clarifying that, everybody. I'd also like to point out that iwi are already intertwined with our day-to-day -day basis of the way we make our decisions. Now, I could start at the top where we have the eight iwi chairs and the three mayors. They are charged to give effect to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. I might not have the right words here, but you get the impression. And provide governance and direction from that group and iwi participation. We also, around the table, have people on standing committees representing iwi. We also have iwi uh, discussing with our staff on public submissions. And now we also have iwi actively participating in our workshops. So that's four areas where iwi have input into the decisions of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, please, I hope this doesn't get me too offside with my friends in the table here, but by providing a ward, I don't see how it will provide any more benefits to us making a, a better decision-making for the whole of our community. So for that reason, and another reason, I'll be voting to rescind it. I've also gone out through my community, my ward. I've been to people in Mapua, Tasman, Machuaka, and also recently to Brightwater. And the overwhelming comments back from them is that they don't want to see a Maori ward. So I'm voting in line with the information that my 
uh, ratepayers, the people that I've spoke to, in line with their comments. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Butler, then Councillor Walker. It's, yeah. it's Joey's doing it. Honest. <laughs> it's, it's his fault if you feel. That's all right. Just, just, just speaking later in a but actually, actually is more of an advantage than you might think. Yeah. Councillor Butler. I was waiting for you to. <laughs> okay, yeah. Kira. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm very pleased to support this resolution. I don't have any reason to change my previous vote on this. Um, to me, this is all about partnership and um, honouring the treaty. Um, I really value the partnership in an area which I'm particularly interested in, and that is in the land and freshwater plan change. And um, it's uh, I can it's uh, it, I can experience already how um, partnership with Iwi is actually um, bringing that uh, plan change to um, a um, a really um, good uh, conclusion that um, embodies the values of um, Maori and. Um, all of us. So, uh, and particularly um, as regards the Waikato Pupu Springs, um, I think our partnership with that is um, uh, extremely important and valuable, and um, that would not um, be uh, valued if this was rescinded. As regards um, the uh, comments that this may be an undemocratic um, process. I think that you only need to open the door on New Zealand's colonial history to see that it is a, a redress. Maybe it's not perfect, but it is a redress to that um, profoundly undemocratic history um, so far. So I'm going to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Uh, Councillor Walker, then Councillor Hill. Thank you, through me. I'm quite happy for Councillor Hill to go first if she'd like. Oh, good. Kia ora. <laughs> Kia ora. <laughs> Firstly, as you would all know, I am not anti Māori. I was born in the far north. I was schooled. I had friends. I lived with and I shared the first part of my life, the hikui, the journey I was on with Māori people. When we started this conversation, it was an anonymous vote around this table. However, my korero then was, we needed to take our entire community on the hikui, this journey with us. We didn't back then. Our community's voice was not present. However, we have started the process of a representation review, which has enabled a few, some voices, to be heard. The one person, one vote, we are one. That's the cloak that I wear. Our role is to be part of weaving a strong, resilient community for all. We can each put our hat in the ring when it comes to local elections. Through democracy, we are all entitled to stand. We are entitled to vote regardless of our education, our skills, our beliefs, or even our achievements. We all use the same services here in our district. The core business of Tasman District Council we as a council are mandated to do lots of things. We all, every one of us in this room, share a similar fresh water. We drink the same water. Where my Paku empties out into is the same water treatment plant as everybody else within my rupu, the group that I live within. We drive on the same roads. Our recreational facilities and libraries are open to everyone inclusive, except when COVID came along. 
None of our services are separated by our ethnicity. So I don't really get why one ethnicity group needs to have a separate representation around the table when everyone else has to walk through the same kind of doors. We put our name forward, we get nominated, we stand, we get elected if our community wants us to be through a vote, a vote that everybody's entitled to do. And as already has been said today, and I did my corridor earlier, um, sorry, I wrote, I wrote my notes prior for this corridor. In this current term, many voices are articulated here. We currently do have, as being said, three councillors who fuck a papa, two different iwis. We have iwi representatives. Some of them are seconded onto our committees, like the operations committee. We have representation on the NRSBU, as Councillor Mailings pointed out. We also have one on the Nelson Tasman Regional Land Business Unit. And if there was more capacity, we know that other committees would have representation on them too. Our iwi chairs, as has been said, uh, meet with our senior leadership, with the mayor and our CE. And those conversations are filtered down into this room and into us as councillors. Iwi are, are allowed around our tables. You are intending our workshops. Your views, your knowledge, your beliefs, your culture are being acknowledged. Tasman District Council no longer operates solely under a Western science. We have now moved. We now have Western science. We now have a policy framework. We have regulatory framework. And we also are looking through a te ao Māori perspective because you're at the table. All pillars, fields, are being woven into our decision-making currently. And as a councillor, we sign an oath to represent our district for all of those who reside here. We don't just look after one ethnical group or just our ward. We are elected as councillors for a district. Today I sit here and I have this... Um, concern really around the capacity that our AE we have. We are regularly told you will have limited capacity. We have waited and waited for responses from you with regards to whether the Māori ward when it got put back out there by central government should or should not be here. I understand your capacity meant that some you didn't get back to us. I would have appreciated hearing your viewpoint prior to being sat in this seat, which is not a comfy seat, I might add, today. We have a, dem a, dem sorry, we have a dem democratic brief process which needs to be upheld for the future of all of our community. We need to continue to take all of our community on this journey with us. So for me, I will rescind my vote that I put in previously based on what I've shared. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hill. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, raurangi tēra maa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, nga mihi aroha uh, kia koutou. Um, some pretty painful um, moments to have to sit through here and um, I feel for you with that. And um, uh, I guess the conversation that's happened so far here, um, I mean, it's hard to know where to start, isn't it, in a way, but um, I guess it's for people around this table and the people who have been around this table for the last, I don't know, decades, uh, they'll know in their hearts how well I've been able to represent iwi, Māori, tangata whenua here. And it's such a strange notion, isn't it, when it's largely been a non-Māori populated environment in here for how long? I think there was a Matawaka woman from Motueka perhaps elected here, um, I'm not sure, quite a long time ago. Uh, but I think before I was elected on, I don't know that there'd been any, any other Māori elected in the room. So it's such a strange thing. I've got notes here and I've just, you know, thought I'd read them and, you know, try and say a bit, you know, coherent. But, you know, the idea that um, 
It's so strange to me that the idea that when when there's been such a demographic represented in here, particularly farmers, I must say, you know, all good, great to have farmers here, but we don't just want farmers here. Great to have landowners, <laughs> business owners, or, you know, <laughs> you know, business owners here. And that's who largely has been here. It's been the domain of uh, non Māori, certainly men, Middle aged to older, usually. Uh, the, the, nothing wrong with them. Nothing wrong with nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you know, uh, it's it's more that that's all that's been here for decades. And the odd farmer got in quite young. Um, <laughs> so it's just strange, doesn't it, to hear? So the idea of having one Māori person elected here. Uh, is so confronting to people. And I just know that you'll know in your bones whether you feel like you're able to represent uh, Māori, Joe Māori worldview, which isn't an opinion. So back to my notes. And, um, you know, it is an auspicious day, really, to be having our second crack at this vote, given what's happening up at um, Turana YY. And there is a direct correlation between the formation of the Kingitanga movement and what we're doing here today. A whole lot of things off that, but actually there's a direct line you can make to this. And, and let that not be lost on any of us. And our, our I think I'm yelling, I don't need to have a mic, but um, you know, it's a lot to feel, isn't it? And our particular form of democracy in New Zealand uh, is highly valued. And, um, but it doesn't generate equity. And and the flood of emails we got uh, from folk, I did write back to a few just asking if they were in the Tasman district and it was good to hear the odd person was because there was no mention of Tasman in it, so I thought maybe it's been generated from somewhere else. But one of the concerns, uh, one of the comments that was made in, in the email was that we'll look at Parliament now there were plenty of women there, plenty of Māori, plenty of people from other ethnicities, other cultures there. And that's only come about through a proactive generation of that through placement on the lists. The Labour Party particularly and the Green Party have been very uh, careful and deliberate about where they've placed people on the list so that would shift uh, the representation of women, Māori, others, uh, some of those folk that get an al alphabet letter attributed to them. Um, and that's how come we have the parliament we have today through a proactive movement to generate that. Because these old systems uh, are just so difficult to change. Even with good intent, they just don't shift on their own. And at the heart of this is power and control and authority, which is what decision-making is about. And it's not given up easily, whether consciously or not. And that's what that is at the heart of this. The other thing the email spoke about too was this idea of one vote, one person, one vote. And I don't know who did this great job of um, getting a hold of that campaign of convincing people if it's a Māori ward, uh, somehow Māori are going to get more votes than other people. It's just simply not true. And it's been explained here already, so... You know, if you're on the Māori roll, if you don't get, if you three months out from the election, if you're on the Māori roll, you're stuck with that and you get to vote in the Māori ward, you don't get to change in that three month period, and you'll get one vote and a vote for mayor. Uh, Richmond, people in Richmond for their sins get to choose four uh, uh, councillors and a mayor. They'll get five votes. So it's just strange how these things that just simply aren't true get a grip, they eh, and get and get spread. So, and I think to the point about the, the point, you know, the the business about how we're working with iwi and um, iwi Māori, mana whenua, and all the ways that we are, it is essential. And we're required to do that by legislation. It's taken a long time to get here from council side. A lot of work from all of you over there for many, many, many decades to get where we are. And um, that, that's, that's one aspect, but that doesn't 
that doesn't deliver people here to the decision making table. And, you know, the reality is, one of the realities is that people who aren't Māori don't tend to vote for Māori people. And there have been um, uh, conscious decisions nationally for people to stand in local government elections who are incredibly experienced, incredibly good governors, uh, and they just will never get a look in. But like the, the rural ward for areas that have a rural ward, let's let Richmond decide on whether uh, rural wards get to exist or not. Won't have a hope. So um, there's a lot in this. And, and to note, um, Eugene, your comments at the beginning, that is a shameful process to have to be participating in. Um, Human Rights Commission has said this is a discriminatory process, the binding poll. Waitangi Tribunal reports there that, you know, perhaps we've read that discriminatory business going on here. But um, if we don't have a Māori ward, uh, you know, I wasn't voted on here particularly because I'm Māori, probably because I'm Shane Graham is dying to say a couple of things about why I might have got voted on. But, um, you know, for some people might have thought, yes, it's, it's important that Māori voice is here. But there's other reasons primarily probably why I got voted on here. So um, I, I'm not sure what people are afraid of, really. And just to be clear, uh, that, that person will uh, take the same oath as all of us and represent everybody in the district. It won't cost ratepayers more because the same pool will exist people will just get paid a little bit less. So um, I'll certainly be voting again. Uh, I'll be affirming our decision to to have a, um, a Māori ward, and I just think that whatever any of us can do to uh, help people understand the things that are, just simply aren't true around this matter, uh, that we'll go about doing that in the, um, between now and October next year. Good on. Thank you. Uh, any further speakers? So I wasn't. Do you want to say something? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Oh, <laughs> firstly, I have a couple of questions and then I'll make a few comments if I may. Uh, so, firstly, Leith, just in relation to the cost of the poll, you uh, gave us a figure of between 35 and 55. I understand that the other two councils at the top of the south have set around 60. One, I'm just wondering why there's such a variation in air cost and and how is it so uncertain? Uh, <clears throat> through the chair, uh, I believe that the other councils uh, have also indicated that the um, costs will come down to the same. We all use the same at the moment, election provider, uh, and we've all that is we've just received updated costings from them, estimates from them. Thank you. And the second question just relates to this process. Um, no, normally, for us, because of our differentiation between the population and wards, we get referred to the local government commission at the end of this process, and that's most likely to happen this time. But the Local Government Commission doesn't have any power over the Maori Ward's position. That's entirely ours. I just want to clarify that before I speak, if I may. Through the chair, look, that's my understanding, but I have to go away and check that for you. Thank you. So I guess uh, there's a degree of frustration for us all around this table today, around this, because this has been placed on us by local uh, central government after a change at the election. And one of the interesting things is that the central government election of all the major parties, none of them had this in their manifesto that they would bring in a poll post-election. So that is frustrating that we made a decision in 23, believing that the polls had gone. And now we're back to considering where rewards and the, uh, the requirement to have polls, which is, as someone alluded to, is the majority voting for the minority. And I, I think that's frustrating for us all around this table and the community. So I just want to talk about Iwi across the top of the largest top of the South Island. I've done a little research into this, and it looks like uh, our two near neighbours, 
have uh, decided to have uh, Maori wards. Um, we have some family interest in Kaikoura, so I actually uh, did a review of a number of councils, and I'll start with Kaikoura around the position they have taken around this. So I rang Craig the Mayor and spoke to them, and rang, bear in mind that they have um, an election at large. So Craig said they initially put it out for a consultation. Ewe came to them and said, look, we don't really want a separate Maori ward. We'd sooner work with you. So they put it out for further consultation and uh, without a Maori ward, and they received no submissions about that. that they're just that they would work with Ewe in a cooperative uh, manner. And then Westland, Raymouth and Buller all had similar situations put out for, uh, for uh, submissions. And in uh, Greymouth's case, they said they were working really well and um, we, we don't see a need for a ward. So they uh, put it out for submission again and no submissions received on the final poll. So it's quite different here where we've received a lot of submissions around this both through emails and for other processes. I think the thing that uh, really sort of um, puts me in the position that I am now is it is really around, we've heard lots of talk around rights and stuff like that, but this is all about representation. And that's why we have wards for elections in this council, because we have rural and provincial areas. We heard about people saying have a farmer's ward for effectively the Murchison Lakes, and maybe the Wyme and Murchison wards in part of farmer's wards. How do you get farmers around this table? By having wards. It's how will you get Maori around this? And they all have a, a challenging job to represent eight or nine iwi across the top of the south in that ward, as I do, representing a vast range of people in the Lakes Murchison ward. And in fact, that's the same in every ward. So I believe that the important thing is around representation and to guarantee uh, representation for Maori, iwi, call it what you like. We need to have wards. Uh, there's very little chance that the local government commission will change us from having wards to at large or any variation of that. They will treat the boundaries, but we'll be uh, with wards for some considerable time to come, as will many councils around the country. Uh, so, uh, um, Wards are not just for geographical, they could be, as people have alluded to, for rural, and uh, they have them for other things as well in some councils around the country. So um, for me, frustrating as it is that we're back here considering this, I am uh, going to support the resolution to have a Maori ward. Thanks, Joe. Uh, uh, Councillor Droney? Yeah. Um... Apologies for the deep voice, uh, recovering from a cold. Um, I will be uh, supporting um, the resolution. Um, I think it's important that I just have a few words just to ex express uh, my thoughts. Um, I think at the heart of all of this is um, something that is unique to New Zealand, which is its constitutional framework. And it's often forgotten in the arguments about, you know, one people, one vote, all the rest of it, segregation, blah, blah, blah. We have a constitutional document. It's a founding document <laughs> of this country, uh, which recognised there were two peoples uh, uh, and that we're uh, constitutionally a bicultural country. Um, um, so uh, in that spirit, um, this, this, this seems to be lying out of all proportion. Um, we've already heard some very compelling arguments about the mechanics of it all, that it's still one vote and still the person has to represent um, the whole district. It's about um, making sure that we have voices around the table. And I heard today some arguments about we've already got three um, Maori voices around the table. This ensures that we at least have one because there's no guarantee those people are ever returned. Um, so this ensures that we're at least getting one voice around the table. This is no different to central government, which has four uh, seats guaranteed in government to ensure that the, the voice is there. Um, so I don't think this is... Um, um, scary or should be in any way feared. It's, it's representation. Um, 
I have a Welsh background. Um, and, in, and in Wales, uh, the Welsh have gone through the same experience that the Māori have here. Uh, Welsh was a banned language. My mother was was uh, uh, caned for speaking Welsh uh, at school, and it was beaten out of people. Um, and in the 70s, they had a resurgence uh, of the Welsh language, um, and that helped... Uh, um, It's an attraction, actually, to go to Wales and, and to hear the language and uh, to see the culture, which was unfortunately dying. So I think it's a really strong thing. We should be celebrating it, not being being fearful of it. Um, and so um, this is also, um, you know, going to referendum as well. Um, I've always been a supporter of referendum. I think the community, uh, hopefully at their heart, will see that this is a good thing um, and will support it. Um, but um, I've never been afraid of referendums. I've called them for the Waimea Dam, and unfortunately some people didn't support them then, but um, maybe they'll support them today. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I just want to uh, say those words, and I hope that the community will get in behind this as well and, um, and support what we should be doing as a country, which is um, raising the voice of those people uh, in, this cult in this country who for a long time were not heard. Um, and governments redress that uh, through multiple channels. And this, this is one of them. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Councillor Greening. Uh, right. So um, if there's no one else, before I come back to Captain Check, if he wants to write a reply, I've got to, I wasn't going to say much, but I kind of think I will now. Uh -huh. uh, I think there, there, it's really interesting, isn't it? As a farmer and farmers, we mentioned a fair bit, I always know when someone's about to criticise me because they go, I've got relations who are farmers. <laughs> I'm married to a farmer. Well, I love farmers. And then they stick the knife in. And it's like, oh, yeah. And I kind of, I guess we've kind of heard that a bit uh, today. It's real easy to associate yourself with something before you have a crack at it. Going on the past is another thing that's come up. If we were going on the past for our representation reviews, only men who owned land would be voting for anything ever. So if we constantly look back at the past and that sets our benchmark, we're condemned to just stick with something that we all intuitively know uh, probably isn't the right thing to do. One person, one vote. That's a classic, isn't it? I love that. There is virtually nothing in this country that's one person, one vote. I mean, you vote in the national elections, you get two votes. Um, there's the list system, so that's not exactly, you know, one person, one vote. If you have an own property in every region of the country, you get to vote in all the local elections. So you might get 20 votes if you've got enough property in all the different places. There are very few things that strictly stick to that philosophical thing that's thrown around willy-nilly, one person, one vote. Um, so... There's been a lot said, again, the technicalities, the kind of, I don't know, the law, um, the Constitution. And even today in the debate, it is pretty clear that the next 12 months and the referendum itself and the election potentially is going to be really challenging and, and divisive. And I find that actually really sad. My greatest thing about my feeling about today, and I've been between optimism and pessimism and anger and enthusiasm and... I kind of parked, I guess, two days ago, I was in the pessimistic kind of, you know, and I have been accused of being slightly cynical, haven't been here a while. That's probably a fair characteristic, I'd have to say. Um, but I was going to share with this anecdote, and I, I wasn't going to I decide if should I or shouldn't I, but I'm going to, because the other thing that's been brought up today and by a couple of people with different, kind of from different perspectives, is the time and the age thing. So the time thing was brought up, I think, by Maxwell Clark, and, his, and he said correctly that the way the law is currently written, if we go to a referendum on 2025 and if that referendum is lost, the next likely date for a Māori ward to be considered as 2031 and to be implemented as 2034. If you think about that and you think that in the context of a generation of kids who are coming through, whether it's kindergarten, whether it's through a kura or whether it's through um, intermediate at the moment, some of those kids will have voted twice. So they will have got to the age to vote, they will have voted twice before there will even be a reconsideration. 
and and my I guess my my pick is having spent a bit of time in kindergartens and schools and coach young people that that's a very different generation of people coming through the system, and to not have the option to reconsider it or potentially vote in that system until that length of time, I think is sad, uh, and that's just part of the way that this legislation uh, currently works. So the anecdote I want to share, and bear with me because you may think I'm going way off track, but I trust trust me, I'll come back to the point at the end. I mean, I've been really fortunate to uh, be coaching a junior rugby side over the last um, three or four months. The great thing about coaching is while you think you're there to teach, you actually learn at least as much as you teach and sometimes more. This is an awesome group of young men. It happened to be young men, could have included some um, young girls, happened not to be this time around. Um, 12 and 13 years old, from all over the kind of Nelson part of the region. So Richmond, Wymere, out uh, into Nelson, different rugby clubs, different backgrounds, real interesting mix of kids. When we made the selection, um, picking 20, started with 80 at a, at a kind of school session, went through a trial, had to pick 20, came down, usual story, first 10 are easy, second five are pretty tough, and the last five you can throw a blanket over 20 other kids. We're two identical twins, kind of identical, like even at the end of the whole six, well, I still couldn't tell them about. Um, they were both pretty good. One was slightly better than the other. So there was four of us in the selection coaching thing, and we were like, what do we do? Like, do we select Do we select identical twins? Like, if we pick one and not the other, how's that going to pan out? On the other hand, if we pick one and we don't think he's quite as good as another kid, he misses out. That's not, that's not ideal. Either. So in the end... After quite a lot of debate, we picked one and not the other. Yep, oh, I know. Oh, could have gone pear shaped. But first training turns up, both twins turn up, clearly. You know, um, mum drops them off. One who was not picked comes up with the coach and goes, Excuse me, what do I have to do to get in this team? Now we could have said, or the, the coach that he asked could have said, You know, sorry, we've picked a 20. You just miss out this time, better luck next time. But he didn't. He said, well, mate, if you want to turn up for training and run around and have a go, there's a possibility someone will get injured down the track. You might learn something while you're here. Um, come along, have a go. So he did. Team embraced him, got around him, hugely positive. Him himself just had that positive attitude, just get in there, give it a go, take the risk. Someone did get injured. He made the 20, came to the tournament. On the Wednesday night, we have a bit of a feed. Everyone comes together, family, friends, whanau, all the kids sit around, put out some platters. Two things happened which were unusual. Firstly, one of these kids just put his hand up and said, I'll do the karakia, banged it out. Everyone was just like, oh, sweet, how cool was that? And then this, this boy says, do you mind if I say a few words? I'm going to read his whole speech. But even thinking about it, I, the, the, the people were crying by the time he finished, including, well, I was probably in cloth. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of moisture. But I'll just read you one line out of what he said. He said to the coaches, thank you very much for your patience and wisdom and helping us develop not only our footy skills, but our character and our passion for the game. Thank you for making me feel included and valued. And it's those last two words I think are crucially important. That team didn't win the tournament, but in every other way, it is the most successful team I have ever coached. One young man's experience and being valued and included had such a big impact on the whole team, their family, their supporters. And what it showed me is if you decide to include a minority, in this case, one individual, it can have a positive impact on everybody else. And in every other aspect of life, when you make a choice to do something for someone else, to provide someone else an opportunity, even if there is a degree of self-sacrifice, in many ways, more if there's a degree of self-sacrifice in what you do, that's a good thing. That's applauded. That is something that everyone goes, that was a good decision. You gave someone else the opportunity. 
I know this debate's going to be divisive. I know there's going to be all sorts of technicalities talked about and the pluses and the minuses and the representation and the numbers, but it's actually very bloody simple. Sometimes you just give someone else an opportunity, make them feel valued, and actually everyone's going to benefit. So with that, sorry for the length of that presentation, um, but uh, would you like to write a reply, Councillor Mailing? Not after that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I will put the resolution. Uh, all in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Yes. Would you like your votes recorded? So if you'd like to record the two votes against, thank you. So with that, uh, thank you. Um, we will, I will draw the meeting to a close with the closing karakia. Kia hiki te kōrero, kia pātia, kia mama te manawa o te tangata, kia e ki te ara mō tato ko ore nei, ko rongo, ko runga, kia tina, hui e, tai kia. Thank you.